Criminalizing Americans for Government Profits is the headline at CaseyResearch.com by contributing editor Doug French. And I think this, you know, this really encapsulates what Davi and I were talking about in the last hour, that basically everything is illegal. You are owned by the government. See, they've kept this a secret for as long as they possibly could, but now the cat's out of the bag because the empire is collapsing. And they need your money. They want every last bit of it in their scramble for uh, regaining composure as the empire collapses. But here, this is uh, an instructive article from Doug French. Let's get into it. Forget protecting and serving. We're all potential bad guys in the eyes of the law that looks to jail us, fine us, and seize our property for profit. Retired LAPD Deputy Chief of Police Stephen Downing told Fox News Latino, quote, The federal government has turned policing into policing for profit. Cops are tracking down cash rather than crime. Downing told Fox that departments now direct police assets to generate cash instead of investigating murders and rapes. And there are plenty of obtruse laws to trip up even the most careful citizen. The American Bar Association Task Force reported that the body of federal crime is so large, quote, that there is no conveniently accessible complete list of federal crimes. Columbia Law Professor John Coffey estimates the federal government has the criminal process at its disposal to enforce as many as 300,000 federal regulations. In his introduction to One Nation Under Arrest, Edwin Meese III writes, quote, It's only a slight exaggeration to say that potentially everything you do each day is subject to criminal law. Driving, shopping, gardening, and even, yes, eating. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, James L. Buckley, one of the very few men to have served in all three branches of government, noted that the U.S. Code, the entire federal body, or the entire body of federal statutory law, has gone from one volume before the New Deal to 33 or 40, 34 volumes by 2012 edition, which is still being printed. But that's only the tip of the regulatory iceberg. There are now 235 volumes of regulations that occupy 17 feet of shelf space of 6-point or 7-point type. Do you know what that looks like? It's like the tiny Bible printing. 235 volumes of regulations that occupy 17 feet of shelf space. He points out, quote, You can find yourself in jail for violating a statute you would never have any reason to know existed. And just as Davi pointed out, he couldn't, with full knowledge, consent to obeying all of the rules of Saudi Arabia because he hasn't read them all. Have you read all of the U.S. code? Impossible. The slide into the morass of incomprehensible rules began when the Supreme Court ruling multiple times that convictions need not be supported by criminal intent or a guilty mind. Clueless Americans can now be fined or jailed for activities they have no idea are unlawful, and eager regulators are quick to entrap honest people to achieve goals to set, just, uh, set to justify government's existence, which is what's happening to a woman out of Philadelphia. She bought a gun to defend herself after uh, being the victim of a robbery, purchased a, a handgun and some bullets, all totally legal, had a concealed carry license in Pennsylvania, took a trip over to Atlantic City for her son's birthday party, and, oh, she was too honest with the officer who pulled her over, told him he had a gun, told her told him that she had a gun, and into jail she went. Now, take, for instance, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA, which has a target on small stock brokerage firms. At Freedom Fest in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, I spoke with two brokers who complained about the FINRA cops. 
One who owns his own firm but is being forced to leave the business because FINRA's proposed fine for ticky-tacky paperwork irregularities is more than what his firm is worth. The fine for paperwork irregularities is more than the whole firm is worth. The destructive path of government regulators is, it just boggles my mind. Another gentleman who works for the larger, I mean, think about all of the companies, all of the innovation that have been stifled by these monsters who are just rule followers. They're just obsessed with rules. I mean, I like rules too. I, don't get me wrong. Like, as an anarchist, a lot of people confuse that. They say, oh, you don't want any rules. No, no, I do want rules. I want rules that I can follow, that everyone can follow, that we can know what they are. These rules are not rules at all. When you, no one knows what they are, you can't even look them up. I mean, that's not a rule. Yeah, yeah you might be written on paper somewhere. You might be able, Have you ever been in this situation where the cop detains you? I know I've been in this situation many times. Cops will detain a person. Then they'll say, like, stay there. They'll hold you in the back of the police car. Or they'll just keep you where you are in handcuffs while they open up a big book of laws. Let me flip through this big book of laws here. Let's see. Oh, yep, yep. Oh, yeah, it looks like he violated that one. Uh, yeah, disorderly conduct. That'll fit. Let's go with that one. Or um, disobeying an officer. Yeah, that'll work. Or how about the resisting arrest charge with no other charge, right? Ridiculous. Okay, eventually, which is essentially saying you can't resist your unlawful kidnapping. Another gentleman who works for a larger firm told me, the author of this article, that uh, FINRA regulators do not respond to complaints as much as creating complaints to respond to. He related stories of regulators cold calling brokerage clients who got rattled when a government gumshoe grills them over the phone. Eventually, a customer gives the regulator enough of a reason to pursue the customer's firm and the next day, FINRA storms in, announced that a complaint has been filed and demands reams of paperwork. When the broker reasonably asked, who complained? Let me take care of it. The FINRA cop refused to tell him and begin their investigation in searching for assessing a fat fine. I've been fighting with FINRA for years in some of the same ways as an organized crime group, says John Busaka founder of the Securities Industry Professional Association. It's like paying protection money in Bensonhurst. Busaka believes the large firm gets a pass from FINRA while FINRA focuses on harassing small firms. Well, isn't that just totally predictable? Who's going to be their money maker? The big guys, they pay off the bribes. The small guys, they go out of business. Uh, I don't need to finish this article. We get it. We get the point. Yeah, let's, uh, here's one last example. A New Jersey man, George Reby, was not arrested, but his cash was. No, it's not illegal to carry cash. Again, it's what the cash is being used for to facilitate or what it's being used uh, for. That, that, that's the reason that the cash can be taken. Um, Officer Bates sees 22 grand. Oh, my gosh. Uh, after an insurance adjuster was carrying 22 grand with him uh, to make an auto purchase when he was stopped by uh, Officer Larry Bates for speeding. Well, stopped for speeding? I'm going to take your 22 grand. Do I have to tell you why? No, I don't. Do I have to charge you with a crime? No, I don't. I can just take your money, and that's justice in the U.S. of A. Crazy, and uh, I don't want it to stay that way. we got to do something about that. Hopefully, bringing attention to these issues is step one in the process. Step two is disobeying these thugs peacefully, of course. But don't hand over your money. Don't comply with them. And at times, you know, what can you do? You, you, know, you look out into the world and see, okay, this guy got 22 grand stolen. Find another way to deal. Maybe in Bitcoin. The cops can't steal your Bitcoin. Speaking of that, we got some Bitcoin news coming up. Stay tuned.